Good afternoon, everybody. I, Mudita Raj, Assistant Professor, Delhi Metropolitan Education, welcome you all to the fourth episode of the Vib of, to the fifth episode of the Vibrant India series. Vibrant India series is an initiative of DME Media School for celebrating 75 years of India's independence. As a part of this series, we invite inspiring personalities for online talk, interview, and interaction with the students. This series will be a year-long exercise. It gives me great pleasure to inform all our audience that we are live on Facebook. The personality chosen for this series will be from all walks of life and from all parts of the country. Our personality for today is Dr. Monisha Bell, Executive Director North, uh, of Northeast Network, a leading women's rights organization in the Northeast region of India. I would now like to take a moment and introduce Delhi Metropolitan Education. Delhi Metropolitan Education, DME, is an A-grade premier educational institute affiliated to Guru Gobind Singh Indraprasth University, New Delhi, and approved by the Bar Council of India. The institute offers BBA, BALLB, BBLLB with BCI approval and BA GMC programs. DME believes in imparting world-class education to its students by training them to develop and enhance their skills. This education and training enables them in taking up challenges of the industry and creating a space for themselves with their co with the competence and vigor. DME Media School is one of the most promising media institutes in the country. It offers BA in journalism and mass communication. It is recognized as a school focused on the growth of its faculty and students through academic and co-curricular activities. Major flagship events and initiatives of the school include the BG Varghese Lecture Series, Peer-to-peer -peer FGP, International Film Festival SIFI, International Conference ICANN, and Mega Media Festival Ritika. I now request Dr. Tina Bora, Assistant Professor, DME Media School, to introduce our guest for today. Over to you, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, our guest for today is Dr. Bonisha Behel. She is a social activist working for the social and economic development and empowerment of women in Northeast India. She is the founding member of Northeast Network, NEN, a women's rights non-governmental organization that has been bringing women of Northeast India and their local issues into the national and global limelight. It was from early 1980s that Dr. Monisha Behel began conducting research in several parts of Assam, which brought her to the realization that women's collective role in Assam is the most potential strategy for their development. She established Northeast Network in 1995, and after more than three decades of hard work by Dr. Behel and her team, it has evolved into three chapters of NEN in the states of Assam, Meghalaya, and Nagaland. She has written several articles on the issue of women and was awarded the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship in 1995. This took her to study the health status of women in Nagaland and her work turned into a large community development program in a rural area of Peg District. Dr. Behel was a member high-level committee on the status of women government of India between 2013 to 2015. She wrote the chapter on violence against women, drawing several examples of the Northeast region. Nen was awarded the Sanskriti Award for Work of Excellence on Social Work in 2004. In 2007, Dr. Behel was conferred the Ananya Award for Women Achievers by the Ministry of Women and Child Development, Government of India, New Delhi. Dr. Behel received the Women Achievers Award of Excellence 2015 to 2016 by the Fiki Ladies Organization, Gohati Assam. In August 2018, Behel was felicitated in the MG Changemakers event at Mumbai and featured in the Better India series for her social contribution, along with five other changemakers. In the same month, she received felicitations, along with three other women, by the Mercedes-Benz company titled She is Mercedes in the city of Guwahati. During February 2019, she was felicitated with the Women of Worth Award 2019 by Outlook Business for her lifelong work towards bringing positive changes at the grassroots level for women in Northeast India. Her journey and work has been documented in detail in several publications and her life has been an open book. Let us now take a look at a few glimpses of her life.
for joining us today. It is indeed an honor to have you here. I now I now request Dr. Susmita Bala, head DME Media School, to please welcome our guest of honor, ma'am. Thank you, Mudita. Welcome everybody in this fifth episode of Vibrant India series. We launched this digital program on August 9 on the anniversary of Quit India Movement. Vibrant India series is a tribute to all those people who made supreme sacrifices for the independence of our motherland. India will be completing 75 years of independence next year. We have started celebrations this year only. This program has been launched as a part of these celebrations. In the first episode of Vibrant India series, our guest was Brigadier P.K. Saxena, who served the country as a soldier, protecting the country on its borders. In the second episode, environment activist, Madam Bhavarin Kandari was our guest. And in the third episode, Professor Ujjul K. Chaudhary, senior media educator and a columnist, appeared as a guest. In the fourth episode, Dr. Nakwe Parashar, director of Vigyan Prasad and a science communicator was our guest. In the making of this country, we all play our roles as a doctor, engineer, as an educator, as a human rights activist, environment activist, and as science communicator. So, Today, in this fifth episode, we have invited Dr. Monisha Behel, who has contributed immensely to social sector. Her work in the area of women empowerment, particularly in the Northeast, is much appreciated. I welcome Dr. Monisha Behel in this program. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I now request Dr. Amrish Saxena, Dean DME Media School and creator and ideator of this Vibrant India series to address the gathering and take the program forward. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mudita. So as the stage uh, has already been set uh, for this program, uh, this is a program uh, which we conceived about two months ago and the inspiration came in fact from this uh, a decision by the government to have this year long celebration. So we will be completing 75 years next year. So we thought that we should also do something as part of these celebrations. Uh, but then the point was that there was no, 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 no point in repeating whatever was being done already. So I thought uh, of some idea uh, which could be uh, different, which could be out of the box. And uh, keeping this factor in mind that uh, we are an educational institution. And since uh, I'm looking after this uh, media school, so in media school, the most important thing is that students should be made well versed as to what all is happening around. They must be aware about contemporary issues or the, the important activities which are happening around. And it is for the media to carry all those social values which are necessary for the development of the human being and development of the society. So that is how we thought that we should try to bring uh, some such illustrious personalities which could be inspiring to the students and that inspiration should come not only through the words of those personalities but through the acts of those personalities so that is how this uh, program has become a reality so we have been trying to rope in all such good people who could uh, inspire our students and that is how in this series in this episode we have dr monisha bell with us and uh, as uh, uh, it has already been told and we know this all that she is one person who has worked tremendously in the 
the social sector, uh, particularly motivating uh, the, 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 um, the common people, uh, the vulnerable sections, the women, and for their empowerment. And not only at the level wherein she is working alongside the women, uh, and as I have seen, uh, women of all ages she has been working with, uh, but at the same time, one important thing for development in today's time is that there has to be uh, such kind of policy making by the government that finally the benefits reach to the people. So she has also been working as a change maker on the ground as well as contributing towards changes in the policies which could finally lead to the uh, to to the development of the society so i welcome uh, bonisha belji to this uh, program and uh, uh, we will requesting him to to start with his uh, uh, words and which will be followed by some questions by me and by the students over to you mudita thank you sir uh, now, without much delay, I would like to invite our personality, Dr. Monisha Behel. Ma'am, we're all waiting to hear from you. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, firstly, let me thank Dr. Am Amrish uh, Saxena and uh, of the Delhi uh, Metropolitan Education, uh, along with Tinam also, who prodded me, you know, for the last uh, few days saying that you must talk, you must talk. And, you know, we've been very busy with so many things going on in the Northeast. Uh, so I'm very happy to be invited. I'm very privileged. And I just thought, you know, since uh, Dr. Saxena has been talking about um, the Delhi Metropolitan Education, I also looked a little bit at it and I realized how important uh, uh, the digital media learning is, uh, is, is, um, um, uh, crucial for young students, etc. And uh, I thought I should talk a little bit about it. Now I've been given 15 minutes, so I'll just say what I can and sort of in 15 minutes. And uh, firstly, you know, people must be thinking I'm Monisha Behel and uh, what is she doing in Northeast? No, I'm married to uh, a North Indian <laughs> and a teacher. But I'm from Assam, I'm Assamese. And uh, I think as a young girl, I remember, I remember very well 1959. Uh, maybe some, some of you haven't even been born that time. But 1959, uh, Dalai Lama had taken refuge in India. And when he took refuge in India, he came via Tezpur, which is my hometown. And my mother and several women, hundreds of women, uh, were, were, you know, they're coming out from the influence of uh, Gandhism. You know, his influence was very high at that time. You know, my this Mahila Samiti in Tezpur, they made blankets and things and they welcomed the refugees, all the people who had run away from Tibet to escape the clutches of the Chinese they came. And I remember I was a small uh, child, probably about seven or eight, I don't remember, 1959. We were all taken to this place where the, the refugees had come in. And uh, I remember distinctly my mother and many other women had distributed blankets, which they stitched themselves. And uh, that is something which will always be etched in my memory. And about three years later came this terrible shock, which is the 1962, the Chinese aggression. Chinese had come in. And again, I'm from Tezpur and they had come about 40 miles away from uh, Tezpur. And I remember, you know, there is a, a mental health hospital in Tezpur. That was just all the doors were open and all the people, all the mentally ill people were asked to run away. Uh, there was a State Bank of India, which we have in Tezpur, near a very beautiful lake. Uh, I don't remember, but we still know that lakhs and lakhs of rupees and coins and everything were put in plastic and thrown into that uh, pond, in the ponds, of, which is called Podum uh, it That was done. And the next 
thing was that DC had run away and the only people who protected uh, us at that time was the Indian Army. Indian Army, I'm told, was not prepared. And I'm not, I was had years after the war. As a child, I remember my parents taking me away and we had to cross the Brahmaputra because we had, all of us were asked to evacuate. But I remember now I come back to my social work is that this Mahila Samiti Women, an organization which was uh, created in 1928. My mother was a part of it. My aunt was a part of it. The, all the Tezpur town women were a part of it. Being Gandhian, they all struggled to see how best they can safeguard the interest of the very poor people in that town. Uh, I remember that in, in uh, 62. After that uh, comes uh, my college and um, I, I studied um, in Darjeeling and then in Delhi in the press college. And then I started reading, uh, you know, working on sociology. And I realized that there was very, very little studies being done, very few studies being done on Northeast. And so I took up the, the um, sociology and I started doing some research in Assam. And then that was the world which opened to me, opened out to me about women's collective role. Uh, and in 1984, much later, the reason why I started working more in Assam is I was in, uh, I was working with an American anthropologist in Mainpuri district. That's Mulayam, Mulayam Singh's uh, <laughs> area and a full decade ridden area, which took me by surprise. But I studied there about 13 life histories of women documenting their lives. And then I realized what it is to be oppressed uh, through the caste system. I then realized how, how uh, 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 traumatic it is for a lot of men and women to live under this kind of suppression. So a four month study in Mainpuri, living in the village, and by quirk of fate, I was living in a, a former dacoit's house, but I didn't even know that he was a dacoit, but I had become friends with him and he, he told me, he and his wife, they really looked after me and they told me about other things that go on in UP. So what I want to say is that I had a cross, uh, what would you say, the education, knowledge of what is UP, what is Madhya Pradesh, what is Northeast. And of course, when I went back to Assam, I realized that this is where I should work because half the battle is won, you know. The women don't suffer from parda. Their caste system is very heterodox. We don't have this kind of a thing. And I said to myself uh, that we, I need to work with women's groups. At the same time, that was the time when the whole world was looking at women's empowerment. And that is the encouragement I got from people like Ila Bhatt, from Veena Mazumdar. These are people, Ila Bhatt is from Seva, Ahmedabad. And I think all the ingredients put together influenced me greatly, you know, to work with women. And that's the story beginning of my work with women. And I just need to tell you, yes, uh, Tinam is right, what she said that, you know, the collective role of women is the most strengthening thing. I remember in UP, you know, that, what is it called? These water pumps were being um, constructed and they were there and everybody was happy with it till one day one woman found that the water pump was not working. And when she went alone to the block office, they told her, ap, ap, please jaye, ap mat aile, you know, because she was all alone. And she worked hard and she started talking to different women. When six or seven of them went together to that same block office, the men, the men saw these women coming from far off and they were walking in a very formidable way, you know, not to challenge him, but they were walking fast. And he thought, oh God, this is going to be trouble. So as soon as they, they came in, the block development officer said, yes, what is it? What, how can I help you? So they said, oh, pump And so he said, oh, say, pump kharab ho gaya. Theek hai. He, and some other guys went and they fixed the pump and the water came back. But what the women also learned was how to use the spanner and the tools to repair the pump again. 
the story behind this is not the water but the role that uh, women had and that's when i found that this is the only way to use a strategy to empower women so from the beginning of my life with development work i believed and i still believe in collective work the second thing i want to say is that you know in uh, you know everybody might think that in, in assam people are really you know women all wear pants and skirts and there's no parda system and they very fast at least when i was in college they were saying they would tell me the the girls of northeast they are very fast and all i said what does that mean what is fast mean he said no they they move around and they talk to anybody they want i said because we don't have a parda system unlike menpuri it's not like that and then i realized that uh, that it, despite people having this mis misconception about the northeast when we go deeper into the northeast we find that you know there is a lot of domestic violence in uh, in homes of people whether it's meghalaya assam mizoram wherever and the other thing which is very bad news is that in all village uh, panchayats which is not called panchayat in nagaland it will be called the uh, village council in the amongst the mishings it will be called kebang in the in meghalaya it's called dorbar shnong no women are allowed in the in this uh, village uh, you know governance and so that is one thing which really took uh, you know uh, taken me back to uh, the people who used to say that women are very fast and they very smart nothing of the sort the the thing i realize is that uh, you know if you look at um, the politics and the participation of women in the parliament you find no women from nagaland or you know mizoram or anybody like that no member of parliament amongst women so to to put it in totality uh, the societies in northeast are not as smart as what we have been believed uh, we were believed to understand and that's when we started working and i must uh, say that one of the principal objectives of uh, northeast network was to bring out a dynamic uh, young group of uh, activists uh, i didn't find that because all our mahila samitis all 1928 like this pro mahila samiti they were all into stitching embroidery and on very much uh, what is the word very calm and congenial and very very welfareist etc but when northeast network came up Uh, i'm not saying that we fought with the government or we were confrontationist nothing of the sort but what we did question was the unequal relationship between men and women now the young students are here uh, i don't think it happens to you in your home but in the villages of uh, menpuri or tamil nadu or even assam we did find that there is a lot of son preference there is the, the you know the boys are allowed to go out whereas the girls are asked to be careful so these kind of you know gender discrimination is very much um, there so when northeast network came up the first thing um, i i focused on was the uh, creating activism you know provoking thought about the inequalities between men and women and when that happened i was also supported by three things and that is the government of india's five year plans which talked about the integration of women in all walks of life the other one was the academic concern people like you who have talked about women's empowerment and the third one is the un the united nations actually promoted a lot of grassroots activism Uh, not by going to the field or anything but they supported them financially even people like us got some uh, little bit of fund to set up a resource center way back in 95 uh, sorry 98 and uh, that was really um, a huge comfort zone for us because we not only got the support but we were able to bring in women from all over the northeast to uh, participate in articulating their issues so from all over the northeast at that time it was seven states and now it's eight they talked about discrimination they talked about not getting uh, 
uh, opportunities, even in their farming and weaving. They, they talked about access to justice. Uh, they talked about public safety and all that. So this is in a crux is what Northeast Network is about. And, uh, you know, every year there have been um, uh, young women who have gone step by step and now they are the senior leaders. I am almost going to retire though I feel I can still be a part of it, you know, but just being sitting with them and holding their hands. But uh, the leadership question is very important. Uh, things have changed, things have shifted. The pandemic came in, uh, we have different kinds of governance. And I think the senior people who are now in their forties, they are the ones who are going to lead Northeast Network. I don't know if I have any more time uh, but I want to say a last thing is because it's uh, I'm talking to DME is that um, along with this kind of work, uh, very uh, early in 2015 we had a new project which came to Northeast Network and that is to start a video center, a film video documentation center, uh, which concentrated on the environment and wildlife conservation. Uh, because we know that Northeast India is one of the rarest biodiversity spots in India. And bringing in boys from forest guards, from the night people who do night patrol duty, very ordinary underprivileged boys and girls, 20 of them every year, learned to handle the camera. And they were trained by the best uh, filmmakers in India. I mean, I, I'm... I know the name, but I don't want to waste my time on that right now because it's a very limited time. And these boys and girls who learned filmmaking on wildlife conservation, on social issues and of the degrading environment, they were made to make films. And uh, just to say that if you, if you young students can say, write something, um, uh, go to the YouTube and look at uh, Green Hub promo from 1915 to 1918, you'll find one, one and a half minute uh, uh, videos on their work. Guys who have never, uh, you know, touched the camera have become filmmakers. And uh, I want to say that. And the last thing is about our women. We talk about women's discrimination. Our women in Assam have brought out wonderful centers in uh, Assam, in the districts, because women, when they get inflicted by domestic violence, they go more inside their rooms. But we train them that if you become counselors, if you can talk about it, it will be good. So we brought out the, the Gramin Vikas Kendra, Mahila Kendra, sorry. And we are right now in three, four districts. And uh, that center not only gives an opportunity for women to work collectively to, their, to do their weaving, earn money, but also to do counseling. They don't have to run to Guwahati to go for counseling. So I think I'll just end here because I'm sure 15 minutes are over. And thank you very much. We are very privileged. Uh, thank you to the Dr. Amrish Saxena and uh, you ladies. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Monisha Bell. And to take the things forward, I mean, the first and the foremost thing which I would like to make a mention here, uh, that, uh, I mean, since you have been in Delhi for lo so long and the kind of experience that you have uh, working in the North India as well as in the Northeastern part of the country, how different uh, do you find working in the northern part and working in the northeast uh, uh, with regard to whatever social activities or the activities which you uh, just now mentioned that you have been doing under this uh, northeast network and under uh, different platforms. So uh, if uh, you can uh, make a comparison and uh, can tell us something about that. Okay. Uh, it, yeah, it's... it's uh... If I talk about UP or if I took, talk about Bihar, I was in Madhubani for about two months. You know, the most pitiable thing is about the caste system where women are not really allowed to speak. They have to be in Parda. They cannot uh, get out of their house unless they go in a group out, even for their ablutions. And they're not allowed to really speak. Uh, that's one difference I saw. Uh, but 
within that, the, the, the women have always got together to struggle against any kind of discrimination, that's one. And we don't find that so much in Assam, though there is domestic violence. But the other thing is, you know, the earning capacities of women of UP uh, it was uh, very home-based. You can make a thousand biris for 10 rupees at that time, 1980s. Whereas in Assam, you know, to go and make biris in Assam, they wouldn't even hear of it. They would say, Ye kya hai? you know, they would only be working in agriculture they would only be working on weaving uh, and then they would look at uh, herbal medicine. But in UP, they were making papers, thousands of women, they would be making they would be lace, lace makers of Lucknow, of Azamgar. In Bihar, they made, did this Madhupeni Bani painting, which got, got them a lot of earning. But I was surprised at the way, you know, even the putting out system of and I don't know if it was Raymond shirts or anchor or arrow shirts, but there were thousands of women who were making the buttons, you know, stitching. It was a, you know, per, per piece um, wages that they got, which was absent absolutely in the Northeast. In the Northeast, on the other side, the women don't suffer from parda. There's a, there's a lot of mobility. And if I leave out, leave out the issues of domestic violence you know they they were women there are women's markets only in the in, Mar, in um, manipur it's called the women's market but if you travel from guwahati to shillong which is another area to, you'll find women who are selling in the highway so street vendors and then women uh, uh, selling their agro agro products and women weaving they, these are the three i think which are the main things, but not factory based, not factory based, which UP is full of. That's the difference. Yeah, so yeah. taking a string, what you said just now, how much importance you attach to economic independence of women as far as their empowerment is concerned? Yes. For us, that is one of the most primary things because, you know, if you look at domestic violence, we did a study with the tea workers. There's domestic violence everywhere. And the husbands, uh, and very unfortunately, they indulge in this because they, 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 they dominate the women. But we found that if, if the woman is economically more independent or earning more, then you find that the, the woman has a bargaining power. And then you find that the husband is starting to help the woman in dressing up the children or helping cutting the onions or something because he wants her to earn, okay? So this is the reason why we, we, we look at violence, like violence related uh, problems in women in Northeast India, and then we attach it to the weaving. So now when we do the weaving, uh, we get the yarn, they make the wonderful cushions, etc., cetera, or uh, tablecloths or whatever. And we are putting it out in the open market, but the wages are very good. And we give very good wages so that the woman can become more independent. The same way agro products, uh, when they, when they um, grow millets or when they grow vegetables, we can have road shows and we call the government. The government of Nagaland has come every year at our, to our road shows so that they can be, they are encouraged to give women to introduce some schemes for women uh, to produce agro products and you know give them an earning capacity. So uh, linking violence with economics into po policy advocacy, getting the government to recognize the worth of women's um, economic potential is something we work for quite a bit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so while narrating your story from childhood till you grow, grew up and then you started doing social work and all, one important thing that you said that uh, your family and you were under influence of the Gandhian ideology. 
So there is a lot of debate on Gandhian ideology from earlier time till date, how much it's relevant and all, and, and today's time, the time has changed a lot. And then the question arises, how much this Gandhian ideology is relevant today? Can you, can you analyze this? Can you, can you elaborate on this, the relevance of Gandhian ideology in today's time? Yeah, to me, actually, um, the Gandhian philosophy is very important because it is uh, bereft of, uh, you know, it, it, it talks about the absence of violence. And therefore, I believe that, you know, when you, even when you talk to somebody in the street or you are talking to a vendor or you're, you're being, you're feeding a dog and somebody says, hey, isko bhaga do ye karo. You know, if you talk with goodwill and with congeniality, I, I think it sort of diminishes the wrath of people that people have with their own personal problems and the way they talk to others. So I, I, I really think, at least in Northeast Network, uh, we have been, I have taught people, not taught, but I have told them, when you go to the government, don't go in a form of protest talk to them and the only way of talking to them is to substantiate the facts. If you have done some study on weaving, you have to know about the, the yarn, how many grams make of each other, what, and, and then you talk to the government, substantiate all your facts, and then you can have a one-to-one -one talk. When you're trying to negotiate with the police, you have to know the laws. What is Article 354? What is POXO? What is this, that? It's only in substantiating the facts that you can gain over the confidence of the women on one hand, and also some kind of admiration from the police, which we have uh, experienced, you know? We have experienced the police actually saying, hello, how are you? Uh, how, what is the work? How are you doing with your work? And I think this kind of respect we got because our women have learned the IPC, they have learned certain, uh, uh, you know, legislative um, 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 legislations that have been passed. That's acts, yeah, yeah, that's the way. And so I think uh, I'm, this is emanating from what I feel about Gandhi. And I, I feel also about Gandhi's thing that, you know, in Northeast, when I look at Nagaland, they're Christians and they're Hindus and Muslims, but they're also people who are non-Christians. They're what we call the tribal community. We are working with them. And therefore I felt, uh, again, taking the Gandhi pr uh, principle of being you know, uh, sensitive uh, to multiple castes and religions and the diversity of India is something which uh, we must uh, respect. And this is the reason why in Nagaland, uh, you know, they gave us land. I, I, I actually, I'm not blowing my trumpet, but it was all of us together who said that if you give us a little bit of land, we will be able to do our work. And uh, they actually got together and gave us a huge piece of land and we signed it. And the one old man said, we are giving this to you because you have brought about positive thinking amongst us. This is what they yeah. said. And this yeah. was in 2003. Yeah. So I, I think Gandhian yeah. principle is uh, important. But, but Dr. Bahel, one thing is not understandable. On one hand, as you uh, told us that there is no Parda system in uh, Assam and we men do a lot of work. And otherwise also we people in the North have uh, uh, the impression that women are much uh, emancipated. They are empowered already uh, in the Northeastern part as compared to the women in the North. But then, why this uh, practice of uh, domestic violence is prevalent in the Northeast? Yeah, the, you see, we have different forms of domestic violence, I'm sure you know. One is the economic violence, not just physical. Economic means the guy is drinking away and the woman is working. And then when she's working, he takes the earnings from her. That's economic violence. Then we have mental trauma. And I think the, the, the whole root cause of all this, unfortunately, which is common to Northeast as well as UP or anything is patriarchy. The, you are a man, when you were a young boy, you were told that you will get 
married and you will have a wife and she will serve you she'll do this for you she'll do that for you and that's how it is and i think we have the same in assam we have got proverbs just like you have proverbs in uh, up or any other place which says that the woman is always lower to the um, man so it, it it is a patriarchal nature of the and uh, of um, northeast that uh, makes women uh, so vulnerable because as i told you the governance system doesn't have women they're not allowed women are not allowed at all okay. and the last thing i want to tell you is about meghalaya it's a matrilineal system so if i am uh, from that system i'm and i'm the youngest daughter i get in the entire property it's the property that i get but in reality because we work in shillong we've got a branch in shillong we found sexual abuse child abuse child sexual abuse the highest higher than in assam and uh, uh, the the thing is when a girl gets married to somebody the husband stays with the girl in with the girl's family with the girl's family the children take the girl's name but in in but if i make a parallel between what the television is showing and what our literature shows it is a male dominated society so the men make all the decisions but customarily the woman actually owns the uh, i mean has the land and her children are get the name uh, her surname but in reality uh, sexual abuse is very high and the government of india has brought up these one stop centers and mm-hmm. northeast network was asked to handle that and that's how we knew about yeah. 250 cases in the year yeah so dr bahel you told us uh, while narrating as to what all is done by the north east network by your organization that you work uh, on the academic front also you have been working with the un also i i would particularly like to ask the academic work or uh, whether you can call it the research work that you have done uh, in asa yeah what is the question i couldn't hear yeah, you sorry i said that the, what academic work you have done as part of your organization oh okay uh when we say academic the one thing which we did not follow and <laughs> is the theoretical aspects of the academia like sociology or history or whatever but what we did in terms of research was only to get the knowledge in order to uh, create uh, in order to stimulate public uh, advocacy and policy advocacy so today if my young friends who want to do a study on the tea workers of the tea plantations of assam uh, we go right inside the tea gardens take permission from the manager and we we do fact finding work and surveys and then we have these you know f fgds focus group discussions and things so it is not truly academic but it is research oriented we have done scoping studies we have done papers like that and then if we do want to do a bigger study then we do uh, try and collaborate with the universities they, yeah. we do that uh, we, we have uh, we would also yeah. like to know uh, your contribution with regard to policy interventions because you have also been referring to this and we all understand that without the right kind of policies in place and implementation on those policies no change is possible in the society so how uh, have you contributed to policy interventions um years back starting from uh, 1990s you can say uh, the united nations had a committee called the committee uh, for the elimination of all kinds of discrimination against women and um, the government of government of india at that time had ratified this uh, this committee uh, this um, un um, um, what is the word for it um, the, not the legislation this charter yeah. and um, every 4 years the government of india had to report to the uh, to the united nations whether discrimination of women has decreased at the same time we used to do a thing called shadow reporting 
and all the women's groups would do it. So for Northeast, uh, the Northeast Network did it. And we, we did the study all over about the discrimination of women. And we were able to say that this is what's happening. That's number one. Number two, very recently, the Niti Ayog has been in touch with us to say that, look, we are very keen to know uh, uh, what is the scale of, uh, you know, discrimination or violence against women. And just three days back, then uh, a journalist had covered our story of Meghalaya, and it has come out publicly in the, in a, in a newspaper called The Print. It has come out. And uh, again, that is one of the thing. And this is how we um, try and stimulate or further policy advocacy. And definitely uh, when the POXO came out and when the, the, when the Protection of Women Against Domestic Violence Act came out or when the Right to Information Act came out, uh, when our, I'm mixing up all the years, in 1990s when the five-year plan uh, approach paper came up, Northeast Network was asked to get all the points there. And all our findings were put in very small, small um, paragraphs because the whole of India was writing. But definitely not. There was a, you know, there, there was a lot of uh, uh, attention given to Northeast uh, India. And I would truly think it is Northeast Network and the teams which worked all around the place and did the negotiation with the government of India. Yes. So, uh, Dr. Behel, I would also like to ask the, the problems or the challenges that you have been facing while doing all this work. And this I'm asking at two levels, the, the resistance which would have come from the local community um, while you are doing something for their improvement and development, and also the challenges while dealing with the government to get the uh, required facilities from the government to put the things in place. Uh, can you tell us something about that? Yes, yes. Uh, I think my experience as a very young woman in uh, 1985, uh, I was working, I was a young woman then. So whenever I used to go to the government, you know, they would say that, you know, you're such an educated woman, what are you doing all this Mahila Samiti work? Why, why are you doing all this? Why aren't you in the university? And I used to be shocked that they, they're asking questions like this because they actually took me as a very young girl. But I think in the years, because we work consistently, they started recognizing our work. But the other thing was a strategy, I think now, because we work with the government of India, with the National Commission for Women, or with the United Nations Women's Fund, where we were representatives, they looked at us in a different way. The same way as the police uh, looked at our knowledge, the way we shared knowledge with them, so much so that when we talked about gender sensitivity, they actually said, let's bring out a booklet, you know, and we brought out a manual, a, manu a police manual on how to be gender sensitive. So in the years from 1995 onwards, I think by the uh, 2000 onwards, the recognition had come into the Northeast network and the, about the village men, Nagaland is highly patriarchal and my team, young team, the Naga girls, they carried on telling the village uh, chief, you know, he was a one huge patriarchal guy and very nice guy, but you know, patriarchal. And they kept on saying, is it possible for the women and the men to get the same wages? And they would say, oh, little daughter, little sister, not to me, my other younger people. Go, why, why do you want all this? Why do you want, don't you know men and women are, uh, you know, woman is lower and the man is higher. And you know, the Christian principles are also like that, isn't it? And they carried on. This was carrying on from 1998 when I entered Nagaland, I mean, started working. 2014, January 4th, the Gaumbra came up and said from today onwards in this village, the wages of a man and a woman will be the same. 
and for me that was a greater achievement than getting some government award you know, because they understood the worth of uh, women's you know work that's the main thing uh, one thing i would like to ask uh, you referred in your talk about representation of women and we all understand that the representation of women is not adequate whichever sphere we talk about in india or whichever region uh, you talk about it may be i mean somewhere lower somewhere higher but overall if we talk about the women representation in any sector that is not adequate so can you suggest certain measures based on your experience what all is needed to be done to enhance the women representation in india i think what's important is to start from village governance you know uh, when we do our work we first look at our own family how is the scene in the family then into the village then into the uh, then the community then village and the state and then national but i think village governance uh, we have really uh, prodded with uh, with the village elders about bringing women in and they have been responding to us so once they get in it's very important and the reason why women's representation is important is because there is a panchayat system okay and there is supposed to be 73% uh, uh, 33% uh, um, uh, representation of women since the 73rd amendment now so many amendments have gone but what is the reason why men are not allowing this and one of the you know stark reality i saw was with covid and i was shocked kerala had an outstanding uh, woman uh, who brought down the covid and she personally looked at everything and she was an mla or mp but when the new government came in she's from the same party i think they didn't allow her to take a cabinet role or something and this is the reason why i said patriarchy is so is something we need to talk about and not fight about we must talk to the men about it yeah. and therefore we want to include men uh, in every aspect nowadays before we would never allow men to come because they would say all oh, these females coming from cities and towns they have come to spoil our women uh, but dr it is like doctor. Dr. Well, I should inform you that in Kerala, the as you said, the government was of the same party. Only there is a reshuffle in the cabinet, and the the health uh, portfolio was again given to a woman. I mean, it was taken from a woman. It was all again given to a woman. Uh, okay, so. Uh, no, but, uh, I sorry, I'm so. I just wanted to ask you. Yeah, but, yeah, I understand. Competence level was very good, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So my final question to you will be: uh, Since uh, you are addressing all these young minds, these are all young leaders, tomorrow's leaders. So uh, talking about the leadership part, because you also started young. and then you grew doing so many things for the society so what can you tell us tell these students who are young who have the capability to become tomorrow's leaders what all they should do to emerge as leaders and taking care of our society yeah well the first thing is that it has taken years isn't it to uh, to make a change but for the biggest change i think is uh, what i learned i learned um, um, a certain methodology of training which is called participatory training so in school i would tell the my girls will also ask the boys that you know when you are small what do you learn what does the boy learn so he say i i learn cricket what, what do you learn ask the girl and the girl will say i play with toys that is where the difference is you know and that is how and because they are saying on that we write it on the board and that's called participatory training and i want the young boys and girls to listen to this that participatory training like i ask you questions and instead of me answering as the teacher you do the answering and it is a self realization that hey somewhere we are making a mistake and that's how this whole issue of uh, sensitizing young boys towards uh, uh, you know uh, towards the other gender towards women uh, towards girls they can be diminished 
what is a bad touch what is a good touch the children, the girls didn't know the boys didn't know but when we told them this is what it is that's how they learned and so i think the media world the hindi serials now on television everywhere they are talking about uh, gender discrimination and i'm very hopeful that young people can learn from it but the biggest thing for me as a development worker is participatory training has the underpinning pinnings of a very democratic thinking a democratic positive mind yeah uh, so with this uh, we we reach uh, towards the conclusion of this uh, program and there are so many takeaways dr munisha behel from what you said in this session uh, particularly talking about the representation of women talking about the gandhian ideology talking about the the the, the leadership role that the i mean all men and women particularly young men and women they should uh, Uh, take it up the the collective work that you emphasized on and then the the beyond everything that uh, uh, the the gender equality that you talked about the women empowerment that you talked about so if we take all these things from what you said and will try to practice if not all even some of the things we wish then the society will change and this will be the greatest thing that we can do to this country to this society when we are going to be 75 years young uh, as uh, independent india as republic india uh, next year and i should also tell you uh, dr bell you refer to ip college for women that you have studied there yes. uh, incidentally that's a connection between you and me i have taught in ip college for almost 15 years in their journalism and mass communication oh. department okay <laughs> so, that's nice lovely yeah so with this uh, we we wind up this program thank you once again to dr behel to be with us and spare so, so much time uh, with our young students thank you dr behel can thank you all the participants yeah can can any participant at least say a word because i haven't okay. heard a young okay. word okay okay yeah Anybody. yeah yeah, yeah. Sure. i really need, sure sure i really want them to know what northeast is on the yeah any any of the students if uh, you can uh, come forward and uh, uh, make your expression say something ask a question whatever any any one of you students if you can unmute then you come uh, on camera or you can put it on the chat whatever whatever suits you raise your hand and ask any question ma'am mera question ma'am sahi hai kyunki unhe rural india ki kafi samajh hai to ma'am main ye janna chahta hu filhal se ki jaise aaj ke din hum log bhi journalism mein hum sare students journalism se hain to agar hum log kuch behtar karna chahe jaise ek insaan hota hai activist wo kuch acha karna cha raha hai wahan pe या किसी भी फील्ड में तो जैसे आज हमारे पास माध्यम है कि हम कैमरे के थ्रू एक गांव की रियलिटी पब्लिश कर सकते हैं तो ऐसे क्या आइडियाज हैं ऐसे कौन से कॉर्नर्स हैं जिन्हें हमें कवर करना चाहिए अपनी रिपोर्ट्स में रूरल इंडिया में and from the newspapers that you know the issues of women etc are not so much covered as as uh, politics or business is covered because you know newspapers are uh, have to make a uh, have have to earn money but i think uh, the most uh, uh, most uh, important um, um, journalistic work can be done in uh, rural areas of the kinds of changes that have been made there of say 19 uh, it's not 9 2000 Ten to now, eleven years are gone. What are the changes made? But I think that can only come with a little bit of homework, with a little bit of uh, studies by studying the the sociological uh, past of uh, of villages, of looking at the historical past. For example, in uh, Manipur, which is is a completely a decoy hidden area. i i am told that it has changed a lot you know the children have got educated and all that they would like to do away with the past and look forward for something so in 
for a journalist to cover that of what happened in 1984 when I was there and what what's happening right now uh, will be uh, very good but that can happen only if you do that kind of reading you know if you look at history books and things like like that. That's, um, that's what I feel. Uh, so uh, thank you uh, once again, Dr. Uh, Behel, uh, to be with us. And with this, uh, we wind up today's session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. thank you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The first impression that comes to our mind about any college, tall buildings, big classrooms, large lobby areas, thick books, IT labs, assignments, class tests, and projects, nothing besides that. Every hour, minute, second spent here help us carving and shaping our persona, cultivating innovative mindsets for the challenging world. Learning is a lifelong process, sharing knowledge, inculcating values of life, spark the innovative horizons of mind. Fun and frolic is the nature of every nook and corner here. A daily dose of thrill we are sure to get here.